Hi everyone, today I'm down at the river with Simon from Sci Finds and Jules and we've got a couple of hours to search before the tide is at its lowest and um, I'm very excited, I'm in a different spot than I usually go so let's not waste any time, let's go and see what the tide has left out So, what are you up to, guys? We're just looking for a little bit of age. A little bit of detecting. A little lace tape just come up. Ooh, so we've got we know a little lace tape. We know that there's... Let's see. Oh, nice. And you found we a buckle, we're in the right didn't area. We've had a little buckle. Oh, buckle. that's nice. So I'm with Jules today, who's here, and Sai, who you all know, of course. Hello. They're all looking for some luck in the muck. <laughs> luck in the muck. Literally luck. Yeah, they've already luck. had a bit of luck, a buckle, a buckle in the muckle, <laughs> and uh, a lace There we go, nice. There we are, the pot's slowly filling up. Excellent. So you're doing a bit of detecting then, Si? I am, yeah. I do like to get the detector out now and again, when, uh, when the moment arises. Well, I can see signs of clay pipage here. Notably, just here, look. You must be getting pretty good at recognising these bowls now in the mud. So let's see if there's anything on the end of this. Oh, I don't think there is. I don't think there is. I don't think there is. It's just a bowl. But it's a sign that there's old things here. That's a 1700s pipe bowl. So Jules, have you found something? Horsey person, but but you found some. Oh, look at that! Oh, that is absolutely adorable. A little horse pendant. That is it's gorgeous. throws up for us. Look at that. Oh, that is beautiful. Oh, is Missing it, a leg. Isn't it gorgeous? A three-legged horse. Three-legged horse. Actually, Guaranteed. do you know what? What do you? It could be a Guaranteed donkey to win the race. No, but if it was a donkey, what do you call a three-legged donkey? A wonky. A wonky. Yeah. Bless it, little art. <laughs> there you are. That's Think gorgeous. That treasure, that. Well done. There you are. Well done. So what have I got there, Jules? Got yourself a bit of printing block. Yeah, I just picked fresh, this up. Fresh off the Thames. Isn't that great? The press. So yeah, That's great. Nice. What does it say? Supply ledger. Supply ledger. Supply ledger. Oh, Isn't yeah. that great? There you go. Nice, my first find of the day, apart from my little, well, I've got a pipe stem and a few pins, so. There you go. Great. I see a coin under this rock here. I'm going to pull it out, see what it is. It's probably a penny. It's probably a Georgian penny, I think. Let's give it a little wash. See what it is. It's quite hard to make out, but I think it's either a halfpenny or a penny. I'll have a look. Um, I'll have a look later. Hi, hi, what have we got here? <laughs> a little bit of Bartman face. Oh, look at that. Circa 1650, 1700. Lovely. Well, you're doing well, aren't you? Eyebrow and eye. That's gorgeous. Oh my goodness. You've got to turn the store, right? <laughs> Okay, Jules just gave me some advice as to where to look and pointed me um, over to some a clump of rocks. He said, go between me and Sai. So I did, and I lifted up a rock. Within and the first five thing, seconds. Five seconds? There's a little trainer's token. Oh my, oh my goodness. And do you know, last time I found a trainer's token, I nearly lost it because it blew off my hand. Okay, this is just um, extraordinary though. 
first you never failed one, then you found two in what, a month? Incredible, okay, come to that later. You're not annoyed, are you, with me that I'm I came to? Absolutely. Just... scraping around a bit and picked up this thought it looked vaguely coin shaped and I asked the expert Jules and Sai, <laughs> namely Sai on this one uh, and apparently it is something. It is something very cool. This is most likely a, uh, a plantation token in the reign of James I and what happened is when we were discovering America in around 1680, that's all the era, um, plantations over there needed their own coinage because it wasn't there was no real civilization there so we started to create the coinage for America um, based on the tin mines in Cornwall oh my god and the tin mines in Cornwall at that time were really depleting because no one really used tin anymore they're all using copper um, and other other metal so in order to keep the tin mines opening they basically created this plantation token and then we went out. over to <laughs> Those darn slippers! Okay, thanks. Right. So where was I? <laughs> um, talking about the tin mines in Cornwall. Yeah. So the tin mines in Cornwall were really suffering at the time. Yeah. Uh, because tin wasn't being used very often. So uh, James the first, or James the second, I think it was James the first, decided that in order to uh, keep the tin mines going, he made currency out of it then they would plan to use it in the plantations in America but these never actually got over the other side of the Atlantic oh I see so they were never in actual use which is why we find a few on the Thames if they're in a field they're absolutely roast because tin doesn't survive very well uh, as a coin at the best of times so the fact that it's been in the Thames for 300 years means that uh, it's even in you know in, in uh, even worse condition but right. you can actually see there there's a horse uh, it'll be James on horseback on one side and on the other side you've got a cross there and on each each corner of the cross would be the uh you'd have like the harp of ireland the scottish thistle i think it is uh the english rose maybe or the lion uh and then the welsh uh, oh fantastic one, so. thanks for telling me about that i'll look up a yeah. picture of it when i get back thank that's you what i can remember from it as well but that's a really really awesome find wow like. Thank you, I'm doing pretty well today. Doing fantastic. <laughs> Getting plenty of luck in the mouth. Excellent. A little coin here. Very, very worn. I don't think I'm going to find out what that is. Have you found something, Jules? Oh, let's see. Oh, look at that. Where did you find that? On the Thames. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, look at that, isn't that's that gorgeous? Yes, that's gorgeous, look at that. I was just scraping around here and noticed this sort of cylindrical, well, sort of cone-shaped thing here. They're prized out and it looks like some kind of old seed pod or something with a hole in it. Really odd. Quite intriguing. Let me just give it a little wash off. That will merit further investigation. Oh, 
I just prized this large um, bit of bone out of the mud and I'm, I'm really wondering what kind of animal it is. It's not something I recognise instantly. I'm going to put it in my bag um, just because it would be interesting to know what kind of animal it's come from. I mean it's obviously going to be something like a cow or a horse but I just don't recognise how it is. Or see there's a couple of teeth here. Oh what have you got there? Well, I've got two little things. First one I've just spotted there, look. Oh, a key. key! A key! A key, and then the other one is there, look, a little lid. Oh, a little Something. token. Oh, hang on a sec. Oh, God, it looks like it might be a... Uh... <laughs> right there, love. <laughs> yes. Oh, like a little bag seal or I think something. think it's a bag seal. Yeah. Yeah, a little lead bag seal. I thought it was going to be a trader's token, but it's obviously oh, a bag seal because well, it's chunky. You might get a trader's token in a moment. So you've got a key and a little lead token. <laughs> right. And... Look at that there, I think it might be a bead. Oh, a tiny little bead. Should we just see if we can uh, get it out without using it? Oh, like oh, half a bead, isn't it? Oh, man. <laughs> you got to have a very beady eye to spot that. Yeah, look, you can see where it was a bead one time. Mm. Right. I was just scraping around this area. Um, I've replaced it to re-find it, but I was just scraping here and found this and I've just been informed by the, the, the boys who know everything, Cy and Jules, that it is a what? Charles II Farthing. A Charles II Farthing! Oh my gosh, I'm having such a good day today! <laughs> I'm having such a good day! I'm going to stay here. <laughs> you won't bring it home again. No. No, she's banned. <laughs> I got some luck in the muck. I got some luck in the muck. Actually, I think I need one of your sweatshirts. Yeah, I yeah. Mud lover. Yeah. What have you got over here, Mr. Sci Well, I've just found myself a little roast farthing. A little roast farthing. Yeah, that's super, that's super cool. Oh, that's nice. Charles the first, rose on one side and maybe a crown on the other. With yeah, that little clean up. Nice. And you can just see the top there, see it's a slightly different colour. Yeah. That'll be the uh, little copper plug to sort the forgery. So I'll clean it up and show you some uh, better photos. Nice. Okay, yeah. well quick get on before the tide comes in. Exactly, happy days. So we've been doing a bit more scraping. And um, there's a lovely little lead token here. Look at that. Look at that. Gorgeous. Unfortunately, not all the things we find on the river are old and historically interesting. A lot of it is junk and as you can see we're coming up to this area here which is just absolutely full of modern day plastic and rubbish and it's really really very very sad so we're going to try and take a little bit of this away and if you do go mudlarking then Try and take some of this rubbish away with you as well. Bring a bag, take some plastic. Because look, it's just really shameful. Just look at it. I'm telling you, mudlarks in a hundred years time are not going to be as impressed with our legacy as we are with what we find now from years ago. Oh, here we are. This is what I was looking for. We have found a message in a bottle. Oh, yeah. And it's um, actually in uh, Chinese, I think. There we go. How cool is that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it oh, would have been, yeah. would have been odd not Should to open find it? one to me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Or we can open it over, uh, in our, over lunch. But... Oh, yeah. 
Yes, yeah, written in uh, well, it's written in Chinese, obviously. So, <laughs> well, yeah. we might need a bit of help uh, deciphering that then. We'll keep it in there for now, and um, I'll open it later, and we'll get a um, translation. Yeah, always keep an eye out for messages and bottles in places like this because, to be honest, there's bound. There's probably going to be another one. This is also the sort of place where we're going to find probably a very sad toy for the Thames Toy Orphanage. Let's have a look. Have you found one there? Found a little orphan. Yeah, it's sort of half, half in and half out. Oh, yeah. is it a little orphan? Oh, yes, a little orphan that needs a home. It's like a dinosaur. Oh, look, he's going to be perfect little addition to my uh, little... <sighs> well, I'll pop him in the washing machine. You'll be able to come and have some friends. Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, oh, he hasn't got any hands, but if he could, he'd oh. do a fist bump. <laughs> Let's do a wing bump. A wing bump. Woo! <laughs> well, there we are. Okay, a new little orphan. Of course, a Sai finds, looks like he's found a message in a box or something in a box. What is it? It is a message. Ooh, that's quite a nice little uh, finds box, actually. Yeah. What does it say, or is it? Oh, it's a note. It is a note. How exciting. Ready? Ladies and gentlemen, what's it going to say? <gasps> it's got a heart on it. Da, 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 da. Oh, oh, it's in um, Spanish. In Spanish. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was going to say maybe it's in French. I could have read it, but it's there. in. Oh, no, it's actually got my name in there. Si. Sai, Sai, was... Sai, and Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great! Well, that's another one for translation. Yep. Well, we'll uh, take a photograph of that and. Um, Awesome. Somebody can translate it for us. Well, look at My that. My first message in a box. A message in a box. <laughs> Trust you. You had to think out of the box, didn't you? Exactly. <laughs> oh, I'll put it back in there and uh, nice. you can have a read of that. Well, I'll translate it later. Perfect. The last bit was a bit sad, the plastic waste, but it is a real problem and we all have to unite to try and do something about the plastic waste that goes on in the world at the moment. But my finds, I'm just so excited to tell you about them. Um, it was a real feast of mostly 17th century finds and they all have, or at least some of them, have a link. So I'm going to start off with my favourite and my best find, which is the tiny 17th century trader's token. It's so small, it's just so incredible to think that it survived that long. Um, so first of all, here it is by the way, I'll put a picture up on the screen, it's absolutely tiny, wafer thin. It's just um, extraordinary to think that it's just been sitting there amongst the rocks for so long. It's a 17th century trader's token. And what is a trader's token? Well, they were made by tradesmen of all types, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, tavern owners, coffee shop holders in the 17th century, more approximately between about 1648 and 1672. And they were made because there was a lack of low denomination coinage and they were for low value transactions. So people could go into the shops of these various people and use the tokens that these people had issued. And the tokens could also be used in the surrounding businesses. So um, there were a lot of them issued and it's always very exciting to find one. This is the second one I found now. 
So this one is extremely um, special. But first of all, let me tell you what's on it. Um, generally on a trader's token, there are the initials of the owner of the business uh, and sometimes the wife. There's also sometimes the date and usually the name of the establishment. So this one here, um, I'm going to put a picture up, it has on it BWA. Um, and on the other side it's 1657 and the establishment is called The Maidenhead. Now, the token was issued by a man called Brian Appleby, and the W stands for his wife, and his wife was called Winifruit, which is just um, a wonderful name. I've never heard of it before. It's a bit like um, grapefruit, but with Winnie in front of it instead. So Brian Appleby and Winifruit Appleby, they had a winery or a tavern, um, because Brian Appleby was a vintner, he sold wine. And they had a tavern, um, at least from 1657, but this is the exciting part. They had it in Pudding Lane. And of course, Pudding Lane is a very important place because it's there where the Great Fire of London started. So just fancy that. This little token has come through from 1657, gone through the Fire of London, and it's still here. So Brian Appleby, he must have been doing quite well because I looked him up on the hearth tax. Now the hearth tax was uh, carried out before the Great Fire of London in 1666 in March. Um, people had to pay taxes on the amount of hearths or fireplaces that they had. And Brian Appleby had about 16 hearths, so he was obviously doing quite well. And he was at the top of Pudding Lane not far from St George's Church, Botolph's Lane. And apparently he used to sell his wine to the uh, church at Botolph's Lane, and I suppose they must have used it for communion. Um, so he had 16 hearths, so he's doing very well. And then I looked up the, uh, the hearths of Thomas Farriner. Now Thomas Farriner was the baker, the baker's shop where the Great Fire of London started in September 1666 and sure enough Farriner is there as well but he was in Fish Yard which is a tiny little yard just off of Pudding Lane um, and he had about four hearths. Uh, Fish Yard was actually one of the, the poorest areas of Pudding Lane but Brian Appleby was very very close to Thomas Farriner's shop and um, the bakery so you know they almost certainly knew each other so again I've got to say that just holding this little token um, that somebody held that possibly knew Farriner, who owned the bakery where the Great Fire of London started, is just quite mind-blowing and quite extraordinary that something like this survived the Great Fire of London. It's quite amazing. I know that Brian Nappleby did survive the Great Fire of London and so did his business because he had a lot of... Um, wine apprentices uh, right up to about 1672 including his own son so i know that his business obviously did survive um, but we'll look at the map um, which i've put up or i will put up on the screen and you can see uh, where brian appleby was in relation to where farriner was in fish yard uh, so that's just absolutely brilliant i'm i'm, I'm just over the moon with this find. It's so, so tiny. I'm going to have to keep it very, very safe so that I don't lose it. Um, but anyway, I've been looking up Brian Appleby and I have found out, um, thanks to a couple of people actually, firstly Nick Stevens, who is another excellent mudlark. He belongs to the Society of Thames Mudlarks. Um, he, unbelievably, also has found a token the same um, a couple of years ago. So it was through him that I found out initially that Brian Appleby was a vintner. So thank you very much for that, Nick. And also a lady called um, Annika, who helped me a little bit with the research on Brian Appleby. And she sent me the handwritten um, entry for the birth of both of Brian and Winifred's sons. Um, Brian and Winifred, they had two sons. One of them was called Brian and one was called Thomas. Um, actually, he had two Brians, but the first Brian died. So he had Brian, who was born, I think, in about 1654, and Thomas Appleby, who was born in 1657. 
Uh, and then of course you can keep on researching and going down all these rabbit holes and uh, finding out who the sons married and what they did and what was going on, but you have to stop somewhere. Um, I would have loved to have found Brian Appleby's will. I think he died in about 1682, but I'm not absolutely certain. If anybody wants a good challenge and you want to go and look up Brian Appleby and try and find out as much as you can about him, um, his tavern was called the Maidenhead. He was in Pudding Lane. Um, the, uh, the tokens issued in 1657. Wife called Winifruit. Uh, there you go. Lots of information. Um, but, you know, brilliant. I've written some notes here. I want to make sure I haven't forgotten anything about that. Um, no, I think that's it. But I think you'll agree it's an absolutely superb find because... Um, it, it sort of leads in to talking about the Great Fire of London, which of course in itself is such a, a huge topic. And again, the fact that that little token survived when so many houses and people and businesses and, and all sorts just perished in that fire. So that's that. That's my first and most exciting find. So now, moving on to the coin which Jules and Simon told me was a Charles II copper halfpenny, uh, or halfpenny rather, dating to between 1672 and 1675. It's a little bit difficult actually to see the date on it, but it's incredible really. It's almost as if somebody dropped their wallet with all these 17th century objects in, the token, the Charles II coin because in fact this coin has a perfect link as well with the Great Fire of London because Charles II was um, actually very hands-on during the fire. He went down, he tried to help, um, he was carrying around apparently a, a big bag of guineas to give to people who were helping to uh, sort out the, the fire. He asked for a lot of the houses to be torn down to stop the spread of the fire and afterwards he wrote a declaration saying that houses must not be built in wood, that houses shouldn't be built close to the river. Um, and so he was really um, instrumental. He was the king, of course, during the time of the Great Fire of London. So this coin has such a great link with the Great Fire of London and with the Pudding Lane token. So. Isn't that just incredible? And just look at it, it's really beautiful as well. Simon did a really great job of cleaning this up and my Pudding Lane token, so thanks very much for that, Simon. So that's that coin. The next link I'm going to show you, a little less obvious, and you probably wonder why I picked this up, um, and I don't, to be honest, know, because I didn't know at the time that there was going to be a link, but it's this part of a cow skull, that's what it is, it's part of a cow skull, rather lovely don't you think, but it does also have a link to Pudding Lane, and I'm going to explain to you why. Um, Pudding Lane, the name, always, I don't know, whenever I talk about Pudding Lane I always start thinking about puddings, like chocolate pudding and steam pudding and rather delicious puddings, but actually the pudding bit in Pudding Lane has nothing to do with nice puddings as we know them. It's actually the medieval name for offal, uh, all the offcuts and the nasty bits um, from butchery, from animals. And there were quite a lot of butchers in Pudding Lane, but also it was a lane that led right down to the Thames. It was a one-way street which went down to the Thames. And um, the Pudding Lane part is named after the offal that was often found scattered on the road which fell off the carts as they were being taken down to the river to either throw directly all this waste in the River Thames or to put on the waste barges. So um, Pudding Lane probably was quite a smelly place full of um, sort of leftovers of animals really, like bones, you know, blood and guts and all sorts of nasty things. Um, and in fact, I've got a book here, I'm going to read you a tiny little paragraph from it. Um, it's called London's Livery Companies, The Soul of the City. And it's got a little description in it of um, what it was like. The butchers in those days used to slaughter the animals there and then on the streets on occasions. 
And here is a little description, and it's pretty gruesome. So if you're eating your pudding right now, maybe don't listen. It says, sweepings from butcher stalls, dung, guts, bones and blood, drowned puppies, stinking sprats, all drenched in mud, dead cat, tack, dead cats and turnip tops come tumbling down the flood. Horrible. Sweepings from butcher stalls, dung guts, bones and blood, drowned puppies, stinking sprats, all drenched in mud, dead cats and turnip tops came tumbling down the flood. So you get the picture. Um, pudding Lane doesn't really have anything to do with nice puddings. It's more to do with the remains of animals and the remains of butchers um, of those times. So. That's how this bone has a link. At first I wasn't sure what it came from, but I've now uh, established that it's from uh, a cow. So there you go, a cow, part of a cow, cow bone. And it probably does date back to the 17th century as well, I should think, by the looks of it. So that's that. Um, now I want to talk to you very briefly about the King James II, not the first actually, but the second, tin American plantation token um, dated 1688. It's again from the 17th century, so maybe from the same person's wallet. And uh, James II came after Charles II. Uh, it's not in a great state because tin doesn't really age very well when it's exposed to the elements. It can turn to dust and uh, so you can't really see very well what's on it but you know kudos to Simon for noticing what it was and you can very very um, faintly see the, um, the, the the James on his horse and on the other side there's like four heraldic shields. Um, of course my eyes my ears rather my ears pricked up when Simon started talking about the tin mines in Cornwall because I grew up in Cornwall and in fact I think I might have a couple of photographs of me sitting next to a tin mine and if I have I'll, I'll dig them out. But they were indeed during the reign of James II. Um, the value of tin collapsed and to help rescue the owners of the mines in Britain from financial ruin, the government began minting these tin coins for use in the plantation colonies. Um, so that is the story of this. Of course, it never made it to the colonies, but that was the intention. So another superb find there. In fact, so many great finds in this outing that it's a shame in a way because I would have preferred to uh, share them out over several videos, but you just can't really uh, control what the Thames is going to throw out sometimes. The next thing I want to talk to you about is this very intriguing um, sort of seed pod or nut with the hole in it. And the hole definitely looks man-made. Um, I've done a little bit of research on it and some people have suggested that it could be the endocarp of an atelier, um, like a mini coconut shell, or it could be a coquilla, a coquilla nut from Brazil. And apparently these were sometimes used as snuff boxes. Um, so, you know, sailors used to keep them, make holes in them, probably put a little cork in it and keep their snuff inside and sometimes they're really beautifully carved. So could this have been a little snuff box? It's certainly very hard and again it, it just looks too man-made. It doesn't look like a, an insect or anything has made that hole. So if you've got any thoughts on that um, I'd be really happy to hear about them but I think, um, I like to think that a sailor had it in his pocket uh, and kept his snuff in it. It's, it's really nice. It's nice to hold as well. Very tactile. So that is all for the old, intriguing, amazingly, absolutely fascinating finds. And now we will move on to the slightly more modern finds in the plastic area. Not quite so intriguing. But as you saw, we did get a couple of messages. One of them is in Chinese. And I will put a picture of it up. Um, and if anybody out there can translate it, then that would be greatly appreciated. 
I'm going to put a picture of it up um, and look forward to hearing from anybody who can speak Chinese. That would be absolutely marvellous. And the other one, which is Simon's message in a box, uh, it's in here, it's in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, I do speak French, but I don't speak Spanish. So again, if there's anybody out there who can translate that for us, that would be absolutely super. I'm going to put a picture of it on the screen. And of course, don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the little dragon who is sitting behind me. And of course, he also has a link to the Great Fire of London because he breathes fire, don't you? <laughs> and I thought, I have to give this dragon a name. And the name that sprung to mind as the perfect name for this dragon is none other than Winifruit. So here's Winifruit, and um, I hope you agree that that is the best name for him. And I'm going to put him up here on the um, Thames Orphans shelf, which is rapidly running out of space. But I'm sure that Winifruit is going to be very, very happy here amongst all the other lost toys from the River Thames. Well, I really hope that I didn't forget anything. Um, I have been talking rather fast because I'm aware that there was a lot to talk about and I didn't want to sort of take up your entire afternoon or whenever it is that you're watching this video. So I hope that you found that interesting. I think there's um, a lot of potential for finding out an awful lot more about these finds, um, but we've really just scratched the surface. But really, um, and I've said it several times, I will say it again, this token is my absolute favourite find. Um, it's just, in my hand, a token that Brian and Winifruit Appleby most certainly held at some point, perhaps when they were walking down Pudding Lane, perhaps they were having a chat to Farina, the baker, um, whose bakery was tragically the place where the Great Fire of London started. And here it is. Here it is, a direct link back to the past, back to London's past, and uh, back to the Great Fire of London. Just let that sink in. So thank you very much for watching everyone. Thank you for your support and your feedback. I appreciate all your comments, as always, and I hope that you have a great week ahead. Um, if you want to give me any more information, the translations, or anything that you might find out about any of these things, then please write uh, about it in the comments underneath this video. I wish you all a super week and see you again very soon. Thank you very much. Awesome. And for Nick. Awesome. Get it? <laughs> Very good.